Happy Halloween, my friends. <laughs> hmm, I know it's not Halloween today. But can you guess what I'm going to talk about? <laughs> yes, that's right. Bones. Zoom in. Hey, don't be scared. That's not a ghost. That's just how your skeletal system looks like. Come. Let's talk a little more about the bones in your body. Let's start with the head. Cranium. This is the cranium. It protects the brain from bumps and knocks. Mandible. The lower part of the skull is called the mandible. It is the largest and the strongest bone of your face. Scapula. It is a triangular shaped bone that is protected by surrounding muscles. It is commonly called the shoulder blade. Rib cage. The rib cage protects your heart and lungs. It is actually very delicate and can be damaged by accidents, sports or even a powerful sneeze. The arm consists of three large bones. The humerus bone forms the upper arm. The radius and the ulna are the two bones which form the lower arm. You have one radius and one ulna in each arm. The radius and ulna bones connect between the elbow joint and the wrist. Your palm consists of three groups of bones. Carpals, metacarpals and Phalanges. Femur. The femur or thigh bone is the longest, heaviest and strongest bone in the entire human body. All of the body's weight is supported by the femurs during many activities such as running, jumping, walking and standing. Patella. The patella is also known as the kneecap. It is a thick, circular, triangular bone which covers and protects the surface of the knee joint. Fibula. The fibula is the outer and thinner bone of the lower leg. Its main function is to provide attachment for muscles. However, it doesn't give much support and strength to the leg. Tibia. The tibia is a large bone located in the lower leg of the human body. It is also known as the shin bone and is the strongest weight-bearing bone. Just like your palm, your foot also consists of two groups of bones, tarsals and metatarsals. Trivia time! Did you know that half of your body's bones are in hands and feet and an infant has 300 bones whereas an adult has 206 bones this is because some smaller bones fuse together to form bigger bones okay kids got to go now Ooh. hey hello friends Oops. Oh no! I guess that's a tsunami! Come, let me tell you all about it. Zoom in! Tsunamis are caused by sudden movements of the ocean floor due to earthquakes, landslides on the seafloor, land slumping into the ocean, large volcanic eruptions or a meteorite crash on the ocean floor. When an earthquake, a landslide or a volcanic eruption occurs on the sea or ocean bed, a vertical jolt is created which displaces the bed and causes extreme tension in water. The water is pushed upwards but gravity tries to pull it down. 
This causes an upsurge in the water levels and the waves start moving away from the point of tension. Tsunamis are barely felt as a ripple on the ocean surface as the water is quite deep. But as and when those waves reach the land, the water becomes shallower and the waves constantly increase in height. They hit the shore and oh my, cause a lot of destruction. It is said the first wave of a tsunami is not the strongest. But the successive waves are bigger and stronger. Oh! And tsunamis can travel at a speed of about 500 miles per hour. Which is almost as fast as a jet plane. And that's why tsunami waves are called killer waves. Deadly, isn't it? Trivia time! Did you know that a tsunami wave can be less than 30 centimeters in height and can pass off unnoticed? If you get stuck in a tsunami, don't swim because the currents will pull you in the opposite direction. Just hold on to a floating object and be safe. So here's the deal. Go watch this video to know more about earthquakes. After all, that's one of the major causes of a tsunami. This is me zooming out. Hello, it's quite windy today, so I thought I'll take a quick flight. Ooh, it sure is windy. Oh no, it's a storm. You mean hurricane. Hurricane, storm, whatever, just run. You mean fly. Oh, forget it. Just come, Dr. Binox. Oh, okay. Well, that reminds me that today's topic is mm. hurricane. Zoom in. Whoa! A hurricane is a huge storm that generally forms over warm ocean waters near the equator. The warm air above the ocean rises upward, thus creating an area of low pressure below. Air from the surrounding areas push in and try to fill the area with low air pressure, which now becomes warm and moist and rises too. As the moist air rises, the surrounding air again tries to fill in and this process continues till the water in the air forms clouds. Soon the clouds and wind spin around, fueled by the ocean's heat and water vapor. Therefore, hurricanes could also be called giant engines that use warm and moist air as their fuel. When we see from the top, hurricanes can be as huge as 300 miles wide. The center of the hurricane is called the eye of the hurricane, which is the calmest part. The eye wall surrounds the eye where the most damaging winds are found. It can range anywhere from 5 to 30 miles. Then comes the rain bands which surround the eye wall. These bands are a series of dense clouds that give a pinwheel-like appearance to the hurricane, which range from 50 to 300 miles. Hurricanes are divided into five categories depending on the speed of their wind. Here, Take a look. Category 3, 4 and 5 are the most dangerous ones. Trivia time! A huge hurricane can release energy equivalent to 10 atomic bombs per second. Hurricanes in the Pacific Ocean are known as typhoons. Whoa, so this is me zooming out. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Looks like the baby star has slept. But hey, you don't go to sleep because I'm here to tell you about different types of stars in space. Exciting, isn't it? Shh. So tell me, how many stars do you think are there in the universe? Oh, come on! You can do it! Guess! 
Well, the answer will be given at the end of this episode. <laughs> Zoom in. So, there are different kinds of stars. The big ones, even bigger than the sun. Small ones, some very odd ones and some new ones. But did you know that they are classified in groups? Yes, there are some specific types of stars. The Red Dwarf Stars They are relatively smaller in size compared to the other stars and therefore they burn at a lower temperature which helps them have a long sustainable life. Some say a trillion years. Nearly 70% of the stars in the universe are red dwarf stars. But hey, since they don't shine so bright, it gets difficult for humans to see them with naked eyes. The yellow stars. These are medium-sized stars and therefore burn at a medium temperature. There are yellow dwarf stars as well that are not giant stars. Our sun is one of them. These stars become quite large just before they completely start running out of fuel. The sun too will completely lose its fuel someday. But don't worry, that won't happen before 5 billion years. Blue Giant Stars As the name suggests, these are big stars and hence burn at a high temperature, leaving them with a short span of life from 10,000 to 100,000 years. Most of the stars you see in the sky are blue giant stars. When these stars die, unlike other stars, they don't shrink but explode. And this type of explosion illuminates the entire sky. There are all sorts of other stars like giant and super giant stars which are extremely big, have the shortest lifespan and shine the brightest. Trivia time! Every star that you see in the sky is actually bigger than the sun. Proxima Centauri, a red dwarf star, is the nearest star to Earth after the sun. So, remember the question I asked you? How many stars do you think are there in the universe? Well, the answer is a hundred billion! Isn't that a shocker? <laughs> I can see stars in your eyes. So this is me zooming out. Whoa! Whoops! I got to be more careful. Oh, hello friends. I am in space today. But you know why? Whoa. To tell you about these magnificent solar objects. Whoa! Comets! Let's zoom in! Comets are one of the most rare objects in the solar system. Often known as the dirt balls of the solar system. That's because they are made of dust and ice. Wrapping themselves around a small rocky core. Astronomers believe that comets are leftovers from the beginning of the solar system. But hey, they don't look like leftovers at all. They appear magical when they reflect light from the sun. That's right, comets do not have their own light. They are reflectors of light. When a comet travels towards the sun, the radiation and heat cause solar winds, which often blow the gas and dust of the comet and therefore it appears as if the tail is behind the comet and when the comet travels away from the sun, the tail is formed in front of the comet. Well, have you ever wondered where are comets usually found? Yes, yes, they do orbit around the sun mostly but they spend billions of years in the Kuiper belt or in the Oud clouds. The Kuiper belt is found beyond the orbit of Neptune. The Oud clouds are found in the outermost reaches of the sky. And comets live here because it's cold here. Unfortunately, they don't live long 
once they enter the warmer part of the solar system. Travelling through the inner solar system eventually kills them and after several thousand years, they melt. Oh. Trivia time! I know you wouldn't, but if you ever plan to go inside a comet, you'll be hit by microscopic pieces of dust. The name comet was given by Aristotle, meaning hair of the head. Hey, all my teeny tiny friends! The most famous comet, the Halley's Comet, will appear in the sky in 2061. But don't worry, you don't have to wait that much to see me the next time. This is me zooming out. Oh, it's dark here and I can't see you. Oh, wait. Hey there! Wonder what we do without lights, right? So come on, let's talk about light today. Zoom in! Light is a form of energy made of photons. A photon is the smallest unit of visible light. Now you ask me, how does light travel? Well, light is unique as it behaves both like a particle and a wave that behaves differently with different kinds of matter. If light hits an object and passes through it, that object is known as a transparent object. Let's do one thing. Take a glass of water and switch on a torch. See the light passing through? Well, this proves that water is transparent. There are certain objects through which light cannot pass and it changes its path after hitting the object. These objects are called opaque objects. Such as wood, the mobile you're using right now and you as well. Hmm, huh? yeah, humans are opaque as well. Some objects allow light to pass through them partially and they are known as translucent objects such as plastic, butter paper and frosted glass. And do you know what travels the fastest? No, not a space rocket. Well, it's light. In vacuum where there's no obstacle, light travels at a speed of more than 0.1 million miles per second. Okay, so the distance between the sun and earth is 93 million miles. But it takes only 8 minutes for light to reach the earth. That's a whooping speed, isn't it? When light travels through different mediums, it slows down and sometimes bends. And this bending of light is known as refraction. Take a beaker filled with water and place a pencil in it. Now look carefully. Do you see a bend in the pencil? <laughs> no, no, the pencil didn't bend. The light rays just got refracted. That's why you see the pencil bent. Trivia time! Did you know that humans are bioluminescent? Which means that they emit light. But their glow is 1000 times weaker than what the naked eye can register. Light takes approximately 1.2 seconds to reach the moon from the earth. So friends, did I not light up your tickling brain cells today? Hi friends, did you just see that mighty beast? Well, that's a shark. Hey, that's not done. I'm no beast, Dr. Binox. I mean, look at my voice and look at me. I'm a tiny little being. Oh. I'm sorry, Mr. Shark. I was kidding. I know you are not a beast, but a lot of people think you are. So why don't you clear that myth today, my friend? That's a good idea. Friends, wanna bust some myths about sharks today? I know you do. Come, zoom in.
It is said that most sharks are man-eaters and they deliberately hunt humans. Which is not completely true. Most sharks tend to eat fish or invertebrates such as squids or clams. If sharks happen to kill humans, it's mostly because of mistaken identity. Sharks mostly mistake humans to be some fish or another animal. I'm sure you would have heard that sharks have lots and lots of sharp pointed teeth. Well, not all sharks have icicle-like teeth. The basking shark has tiny teeth, which it does not even use for hunting or feeding. And the horn shark has molar-like teeth, which is used to crush its hard-shelled prey. It is often believed that sharks are indiscriminate killers. But most of the times, they are victims of massive hunting for their fins, which is made into shark soups. Whoa! Whoa! People claim that shark fins are tasty and have a lot of nutritional value, which is absolutely untrue. Shark fins are tasteless with absolutely no nutritional value. And if you think sharks have no predators, you're wrong. Humans are their biggest predators. If you actually look at numbers, you'll be surprised to know that sharks kill approximately 6 humans in one year. Whereas humans kill about 100 million. Now, that's called being indiscriminate. Sharks also help a lot in maintaining the balance of life. Since they are the top of the food chain, they keep the marine population in check. Trivia time! There are approximately 500 species of shark, out of which white sharks, tiger sharks and bull sharks are the most dangerous ones. Sharks have an extremely strong sense of smell. Almost two-thirds of its brain is dedicated to the sense of smell. So friends, now you know that sharks are a lot more than their scary teeth. You're right, Dr. Binox. Thanks for clearing the silly myths about me. I owe you one. Oh, come on. Let's drink some soup. Uh, oh, really? Soup? Not shark fin soup. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so, this is me zooming out. Hello, kids. Won't it be great if we could just pack our bags and keep flying from place to place? Hey, but you can't do that because you don't have wings like me. Oh, yes, you're right. But there's one major difference between you and my friends out there. And that is? You're a migratory bird, silly. Ooh, oops. Why didn't that strike me? Doesn't matter. You go take your flight and I'll tell my friends all about birds like you. Oh, I feel so special, Dr. Binox. <laughs> Come, friends, let's know more about migratory birds. Zoom in. Migratory birds are those birds that travel from one place to another at regular intervals over long distances. And they migrate to escape the cold, harsh winter weather in search of food and a warm, cozy shelter. There are various types of migratory birds. Resident birds, pigeons and doves are good examples. These birds just don't migrate. They are able to find food and a warm shelter where they are staying. We might not travel a lot, Dr. Binox, but we do spread love all around from place to place. Short distant migrants. Robins are short distant migrants. As the name suggests, these birds move only a short distance from lower elevations to mountainside. Hey, but don't you mistake me for a nightingale. I might look like one, but I'm not, okay? Oh, my friends won't. They are very smart. Aren't you guys? Medium distant migrants. These birds travel over distances that cover several states. 
they don't really travel a lot, but not that they won't travel less, isn't it, Mr. Blue Jay? Hmm, you seem to know me quite well, Dr. Binox. But there's one more secret about me, wanna know? Sure, tell us. We are all waiting. Hmm, I'm quite mischievous, Dr. Binox, because I hunt more than I can eat. <laughs> Long distant migrants. These birds travel typically from United States and Canada to wintering grounds in Central and South America. The Arctic Tern is an example of long-distance migrants. And I am the record holder for covering the longest distance of 44,000 miles. Oh my, that's huge! Just to let you know, the circumference of the Earth is approximately 29,000 miles. So imagine how much these birds travel. Trivia time! Before migrating, many birds enter a state of hyperphagia, where the hormone levels compel them to drastically increase their body weight to store fat to use as energy while traveling. And some birds also have the ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field to help them navigate. So I need to travel now. Wait till I come back next. I feel plants are the nicest beings on this planet. They never harm anyone. Rather, they get eaten all the time. Oops! I guess some eat too. And that's why I am here today to tell you about plants that eat meat. Come with me. Zoom in! Plants that capture prey such as insects, spiders, mites and eat meat for their survival are known as insectivorous or carnivorous plants. Most of the carnivorous plants live in wet boggy areas where the soil doesn't have much nutrients. They derive their nutrients from their prey and whatever little nutrients available to them through soil. They have a strong digestive system which helps break down complex food items. The different types of carnivorous plants are Pitfall traps Popularly known as pitcher plants. They are pitcher plants because they look like pitcher shaped vessels filled with fluid. The insect is lured by the syrupy fluid and just when they come to drink it they get drowned. Some pitcher plants have a lid on them to trap their prey. Flypaper traps. Some flypaper traps have leaves covered with a sticky substance on which the prey gets caught. These plants also digest their prey through their leaves. Other kind of flypaper traps use tentacle like stalks covered with glands to trap and digest insects. Their stalks have digestive soup on them to absorb the nutrients. Snap traps. Venus flytrap is the most popular snap trap. Here the plant has mouth like leaves that literally snap shut when an insect or spider lands on it. There are some snap traps that are found under water and they are known as water wheel plants. They do the same thing but under water. Bladder traps. Plants of this kind work in the most interesting way. Where there are sacs on the plant known as bladders that create vacuum and suck the insect to digest it later. Lobster pot traps. The plant first lures its insects with its sweet smelling nectar. Once the insect is trapped inside, it sees light shining through the leaves, which looks like exits. To escape, the insect travels towards the light, which is nothing but another trap. This is the plant's way of actually misdirecting the insect to the inside of the pitcher, where it is caught and eaten by the digestive liquids. Trivia time! Some pitcher plants are so large they can catch and consume rats and frogs. 
Some carnivorous plants reflect ultraviolet light to attract their prey. Hey, don't go there. Wait, I'll help you. Oh, let go. Oh. So, this is me zooming out. <coughs> oh, who's that? Hey, you're disturbing the air around us. Uh, sorry, I know I'm farting a lot today. <coughs> Oops. Hmm, guess you took in a lot of carbon dioxide for lunch yesterday. <coughs> oh, you yeah, could be. <coughs> Did you just hear them, friends? Oh no, not their farts. <laughs> And that reminds me that I need to tell you about the process of excretion in plants. Come with me. Zoom in. Just like humans, plants do feel the need to remove all sorts of waste material from their bodies. However, plants have a much simpler process of excretion. Hey, did you know that plants sweat? Well, yes. Just like humans have sweat glands, Plants have small openings under their leaves called stomata that release water and oxygen. Just how the pores of your body release sweat. But their waste material is a lot more useful than ours. <laughs> plants also release waste by accumulating it in the vacuoles of aging leaf cells. The leaves then fall off, eventually removing the waste material. This process is known as abscission. Don't you sometimes have dry skin that eventually falls off? Yep, kinda same. Have you noticed leaves changing their color in autumn? This happens mostly because of the waste pigments that start getting stored inside the leaves. See the sticky fluid? Well, this is another kind of waste produced by the plants, which is often oozed out from the bark of trees. Apart from the sticky fluid, there are other waste products like resins, gums and latex. But hey, you got to be careful because sometimes these products can be poisonous. But most of the other times, they are quite useful. For example, latex is used to produce gloves and clothing. Trivia time! The bark of a willow tree produces a chemical that helps in the making of aspirin, a medicine for pain and fever. Oak leaves turn brown due to the waste material in them. So friends, plant more and more trees because they are the reason why you can breathe. <sighs> breathe in, breathe in out. That's what I say throughout. Breathe in, breathe in out. That's what I say throughout. Phew. <sighs> oh, so you've been watching me work out, eh? Rather, breathe in and breathe out. Whew, this is tiring. So, anyways, why don't we talk about breathing today? Still can't get a hint? Well, today we talk about the human respiratory system. Zoom in! Alright, do this right now. I'm watching you. Just start running wherever you are. Run, 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 run. Now stop. Isn't your breathing heavy? Well, that's because right now your body needs more oxygen to breathe. And you get oxygen from the air around you. Without oxygen, you'd be like a car without fuel. A waterless pool. And wouldn't that be uncool? One of the major reasons why you're alive is oxygen. So, take a deep breath in. When you breathe in, you take in oxygen present in the air. The air then passes through your nostrils. There are tiny hair present in your nostrils that obstruct all the dust particles. Then the air travels through the windpipe 
also called the trachea, which filters the air inhaled. The trachea branches out to two tubes called bronchi, where tiny hair called cilia move back and forth, moving the mucus inside. The mucus is a sticky substance that collects germs and other particles that might harm the lungs. The bronchi then carry air into each lung. The right lung has three lobes, whereas the left lung has two lobes. The left lung is slightly smaller in size to give space to the heart. These lobes are filled with small and spongy air sacs called alveoli, where the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide happens. It is here the blood picks up oxygen and lets go of carbon dioxide. Just beneath the lungs, there is a dome-shaped muscle called diaphragm that contracts when you breathe in and expands when you breathe out. It also separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. Trivia time! The lungs are the only organs that can float on water. A person breathes approximately 20,000 times in one day. So friends, didn't you just gasp and grasp all the facts? <laughs> this is me zooming out. <laughs>